Hi there, in this video we're going to talk about the characteristics of data. So we're going into chapter 2, organizing, summarizing data, and we're going to do some histograms in this um, activity. I encourage you to download the notes ahead of time. If you haven't done that, go through the notes. There is an activity here that you need to do before you watch the video so that you have the data. But just to get us started, um, when we think about data, we have to keep in mind the, and consider the changing characteristics of populations over time. So here's an example of things that I want you to think about from 100 years ago in the United States. So 100 years ago, 8% of homes had a telephone. So think about that now. Like if you think about including smartphones, what percentage of homes in the U.S. do you think have a phone of sorts, whether it's a home phone or a smart or a cell phone. Is it going to be more than 8%? <laughs> For sure, right? So the, a lot has changed. So um, when we collect data and we when we make observations about a population, we have to keep in mind that as times change, we have to collect new data and adjust. Um, so 100 years ago, 14% of homes had a bathtub. The mean life expectancy was 47 years. So that's pretty crazy to think about that. A hundred years ago, people were expected to live to 47 years. The mean hourly wage was 22 cents. Now it's going up there to $15 an hour, so times change. There were approximately 230 murders in the entire United States a hundred years ago. So a lot, lots has changed. So although these observations from a hundred years ago are in you know, very stark contrast to the United States of today, statistical analysis should always consider the changing population characteristics that might have more subtle effects. So when we collect data, those are the things that we we look for and try to make analysis. So when working with large data sets, we're going to use frequency distributions and relative frequency distribution tables to help us organize and summarize data. So a frequency distribution helps us to understand the nature of the distribution of a data set. And here's a little definition. The frequency is just how many times, how often, right, the number of original values that fall into that class. So we're going to start with this activity. How do the colors of M&Ms vary? So first off, um, if you haven't done this already, pause your video and go back to the notes. I posted a, a handout with a blank note, so download that and do this activity before coming back to the video. So this it, so pause it if you haven't done it, do the activity, come back and continue. So what I want you to do is, if you have a bag of M&Ms handy or if you happen to buy one, um, then weigh it. I'm gonna send a survey later so asking for the weight of your bag of M&M and then for the following information. So if you don't have a regular size bag of M&Ms, um, you can go to this M&M simulator. And so if you don't have an actual bag of M&Ms, don't worry about weighing it. I will find different data for that when we get to that activity. So open your bag of M&Ms and count the number and the percentage of each color that you get. And so I've created this this is a relative frequency distribution table for our colors of M&Ms. So I use the simulator, and so I'm going to show you um, my distribution of M&Ms. So let me paste it in here real quick. So notice that I did say that the average, so if you're using the simulator, the average number of M&Ms in a regular size is 56. You can try numbers above or below or equal to 56. So in my example, I tried 55. And so I did, so this is my simulation result for the colors in a regular size M&M bag. And if you have those, um, if at home you have the fun size, then it's about three of those bags that equal um, a regular size bag. All right, so then here are, once you have your data, you can start putting it in. So my number of blue M&M was 11, my number of orange M&M was 10, the number of green was also 11, yellow was 11, 
they were pretty even. And then red was six and brown was six. And then if I add those up, I should get 55. Right, 55 is what I put in here. If you have, if you're using an actual bag of M&Ms, then just sort them by colors and then add these all up and see what your total is. Now the relative frequency, I give you the formula here, the relative frequency for a class. So these are our classes are the categories. So in this case, we are dealing with a categorical variable because we're keeping track of the color of M&Ms. So that's a category. And so our categories are blue, orange, green, yellow, red, and brown. So if for categorical data, we um, define it as binary or non-binary. So what would you say this one is? We have our variable as categorical and this is non-binary. Right. To be binary, that means there are only two options. We have more than two options here. We have blue, orange, green, yellow, red, and brown. So more than two. Um, so, But this is a categorical variable, non-binary. So the relative frequency is the frequency for a class. Right? So these are our classes, blue, orange, green. So the number for blue, for example, is 11. The number for red is 6. So divided, then there's the frequency for that class divided by the sum of all frequencies. So the total, or 55. So for blue, my what is my relative frequency? So divide 11 by 55, and I'm going to get 0 .0, 0.20. And then 10 divided by 55, I get 0.18. And the nice thing about my data was that was so similar is that I get to choose copy I already computed 11 divided by 55 here so I get to just repeat those values now six the relative frequency so is the number that I get in that particular class of so red divided by the total so six divided by 55 is going to give me 0.11 and the same thing for brown and my total so if you add these up you should get close to one I got exactly one but the reason I say you should be close to one is depending on your rounding. So if you round it up of your, or if you round down, you may be like 0.98 or 1.02 or something like that. But you should still, all these relative frequencies, they're essentially a proportion. And so a proportion is going to be less than one. It's, and one of the things we're going to talk about is that this relative frequency is the probability. So what's the probability of getting blue in a bag of MNX? 0.20. And then the percentage, we take our relative frequency, because notice here, the percentage for a class, it says it's the frequency for a class divided by the sum of all frequencies times 100. But this, the frequency for a class divided by the sum of all frequencies is what we computed up here, which is a relative frequency. So a quicker way to think about this is that it's just your relative frequency from up here times 100. So then this is gonna be 20%, 18% and so on. And 11% and 11% and they should all add up to what? They should add up to 100, right? Because that gives me the whole bag of M&Ms, 100% of the candies. And so now we have our relative frequency and our percentage. So now we can construct a bar chart using our candy. So draw a bar graph based on blue, orange, green, yellow, red, and brown. And if you want, you can color it and make it all nice. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot on the x-axis is your colors, your classes blue, orange, green, yellow, red, and brown. And on the y-axis, we're going to have our relative frequency. So that's going to be the y-axis, the relative frequency or the proportion. And so based on our numbers, you can go, you can label it by the scale based on these low numbers, right? 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So that's probably what we're going to do. So let me insert what my bar chart looked like. All right, so here's my relative frequency histogram. 
if you have Excel, you can do this in an Excel too. Just put in the colors and then do your, your frequencies, relative frequencies, and then just create a bar chart and then it will produce this. And so here's our distribution. Now notice that my scale, so I did this in Excel and it just went to 0.25, but that's because it didn't go higher than that. So I could make it go to one and then my, is, but then everything will be a lot smaller. So we'll just leave it like this for, for now, but this allows us to see the distribution of the graph. So my bag of M&Ms had lots of blues, greens, and yellows, and not that many red and brown. So the distribution of the colors where we are able to see it in this histogram. So the important uses of histograms are they visually display the shape of the distribution. They show the location of the center of data. So I could kind of see, well, well, that's more for when we have quantitative data. We can kind of pick out the average based on the shape of the graph. Uh, it shows the spread of the data and identifies any outliers. So right now, outliers is something that it doesn't happen very often in our distribution. So if I had something like for brown, for example, or red, that was really small. Like if I only got two candies out of 55, that would be an outlier. So red will be considered um, not very uh, popular color in that bag. So let's look at an example of quantitative data. The great resignation, you may be hearing about that in the news lately. So since March 2020, many people have decided to leave their jobs, causing the great resignation we're seeing today. So I pulled some data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics and did and pulled it here for you. So from 2020 and 2021, and I took the entire year just so that I wouldn't have like a partial year. I know that the great resignation, it says from March 2020, right since the pandemic hit, but I just wanted to take all 12 months in each year. So we're looking at 2020 and 2021, and these are our numbers in millions. So what are we tracking here? What's the variable? So here it says below, you'll see the data starting in January 2020 for the number of people who resigned from their job during that time. So we're keeping track of the number of people who resign from their job. So that's what we are looking at. So what does that, what kind of variable is that? The number of people, so this is quantitative. And then my next question will be, is it a discrete or continuous? So looking at, we're gathering it in millions so 3.6 million, 3.4. So the number, even though we are keeping track of the number of people in the United States, this is in millions. So then we're going to say it's continuous just based, based on this because we can go from 2.1, even just between 2.1 and 2.2, there are infinitely many things in there. So we're going to say is continuous just the way that we are tracking it because of our unit in millions. And then some definitions, I define lower class limits, upper class limits, boundaries, the midpoints, and the class width. And the class width is the difference between two consecutive lower class limits in a frequency distribution. And so the key point here is that finding the correct class width can be tricky. The most common mistake that I see is people will do um, the lower class limit with an upper class limit and try to find the the class width that way or trying to find the midpoint that way so just be careful about that it's always the lower class limits so follow the procedures here to construct the frequency distribution for this data we're going to select five as the number of desired classes the convention let me make a note here convention is to use five to nine classes why is that? Well, or the classes are the things that are given as the histogram. So you don't want to notice that even with how many do we have here? Six classes for this categorical data histogram. It looks kind of busy, right? So if you start having like 20 classes or more than that, it's just going to look really busy. So convention, you want to try to group your data between five and 
10 classes, like 5 to 9 is usual convention. All right, so then um, we are going to use 5 because our data is not very, we don't have a lot of data points. We have 24, right, 12 months in each year. We have two years. So we only have 24 data points. So there's no reason for us to make it um, bigger than 5. And then the class width, the, to calculate the class width, we're going to round to a more convenient number as well. So the class width is the maximum data value minus the minimum data value recorded divided by the number of classes chosen. So we chose five as our class number. So in our case, right, the minimum data value is 2.1, which is not a very convenient starting point. So go to a value below 2.1 and select the more convenient value of 2 as the lower class limit. So that means then we're going to have the maximum data value, which was, what was it? Looking back at the data, the maximum data value is in the 4s, 4.5. And then the lower, the lowest one was 2.1 over here. So let me highlight those. So that's the lowest. And then 4.5 is the highest. That because 2.1 is not such a nice number like 4.5, then oops, we are going to um, round it to 2. So find a more convenient number. I'm struggling over here. Okay. So when we do this, we are going to then have equals 4.5 minus 2 and then divided by our number of classes which was 5 and so there is our class width so this is going to be 0.5 and so that makes it a little nicer to work with now if you left it at the maximum value in the minimum value, so you would have had 4.5 minus 2.1 divided by 5, you would have gotten 0.48. Now you still would want to round to a more convenient number then, which 0.48 you will round it to 0.5. So it's either you round when when you do this, or you round you select the minimum data value for, to be a more convenient value. What um, choosing a more convenient value allows us to do is that then that value becomes our first lower class limit. So we're going to set 2 as our first lower class limit. I keep doing that, highlighting. I want to highlight, but I keep changing the font color. There we go. So step 4, add the class width of 0.5 to the starting value of 2 to get the second lower class of 2.5, and then we're, you're going to continue until you're completely done. So what are our class limits? So we're going to have the 2, 2.5, 3, so add 0.5 every time, 3.5, 4, is that 5? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and, yes. and that is it. So those are our lower class limits. So on our histogram, right, we then that's going to be here. So we're going to go 2 to 2.4, and then we're going to start 2.5 to 3, 3.5, and so on. So that's, we're trying to build it. So notice that with quantitative data, the process is a little more convoluted. With categorical data, it's nice because our classes are just the categories. But with quantitative data, we have to um, break apart our data into classes so it's kind of like that each class is sort of the range of values that are going to go in that class so when I'm saying so the class class width is 0.5 so my lower class limits are 2 and 2.5 so that means that my first bar of my histogram is going to contain values from 2 to 2.5 not including 2.5 right because that's going to be my next lower limit and so on and so we're going to tally the values that show up in here. And so notice that I put my, my class limits here. So from 2 to 2.4, because my lower class
class limits are 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4. And you don't want classes to overlap. Right? If classes overlap, then if you have a value, say I had 2 to 2.5 here and 2.5 to 9, then where do I put 2.5? Do I put it in the first class or the second class? So you don't want to run into that problem, so we just don't overlap the classes. So we're going to go from 2 to 2.4, 2.5 to 9, and to 2.9, and so on. So now our frequency here. How often did this happen from 2 to 2.4? So let's go back to our data. So from 2 to 2.4, how many values are there? Then you can pause the video and count them if you haven't done this activity on your own yet. All right, so now that you've had time to count them, we're going to fill it in here. So how many between 2 and 2.4? Yep, I had 2. And then from 2.5 to 2.9, now, now we include 2.5 in this class, right? So I also had 2. From 3 to 3.4? there were 9, and then from 3.5 to 3.9, there were 3, and then from 4 to 4.5, there were 8. So here we do include the 4.5. It doesn't make sense to put a separate class for just the one value, so that one has 8. Um, when constructing a frequency distribution, be sure that the classes do not overlap. So that was my key point there that I already explained. And so now we're going to draw our histogram for this and then decide what shape it has. So what are the common distribution shapes? We have bell shape, which is the normal distribution. That's what it's called, normal distribution. We have uniform distribution, where there's no much change. We have skewed to the right. So skewed to the right means that it has a right tail. And skewed to the left means that the data has a left tail. And so let's graph our histogram for this data. So try to do it on your own and then we'll compare and do it for your own data because I like to see what that is. And like I said, I'm going to send you a survey um, to input your data in there because we'll use it for a whole class project. Well, not project, but discussion. All right, so here is my histogram. So we have in this from 0 to 10, and because we did have a 9, right, so from 3 to 3.4 million, so this gives us an idea of how the data is distributed. This is this represents the number of people who resigned their job between 2020 and 2021. Oh, hang on. My, my labels are backward. Okay, here we go. So this is the number who resigned their jobs in millions, and then we have the frequency. How often did that happen? So notice that 3 to 3.4 million happened quite often, and 4 to 4.5 million people who resigned their jobs between 2020 and 2020, 2021 happen quite often. Now, in terms of the shape of the distribution, what would you say it is? Is it normal? Is it uniform? Is it skewed right? Does it have a right tail? Or is it skewed left? Does it have a left tail? So let's go back and look at it. And most of the data seems to be here on the right. So I would say it has a, it's skewed left. It has a left, left tail. So let's say skewed left and a left tail. So that's how we determine the skewedness of the graph. Oftentimes, the um, people think that, oh, well, most of the data is on the right, so it's skewed right. No, you look at not where the most of the data is, is where is the tail, so where is less data, and that is on the left. So it has a tail to the left, so then it is skewed left. Now with the statistics, something that happens is once we have a study, oftentimes the study generates more questions, right? Like, so here we wanted to know like, well, how many people are quitting their job during the pandemic? Now that we know, what questions come to mind for you? And some of you may be asking like, well, why is that, right? Is it really the pandemic or is there something else going on? And other questions might be, well, what industries? are affected, like where, what is the industry that people are 
resigning from their job the most. And other things, what, about, what are the demographics, right? Maybe age. What is What ages are resigning more than others? Um, some of the things that may come up are age may be a factor, right? Because someone older who has a family, and so that might, be, that might be another variable. Do they have a family or not? Because someone who's older and has a family is probably less likely to resign from their job than someone who is young and doesn't have a family yet. So those are the then things as we learn, as we collect this data, right? Once you have the data, what else was asked? What, what else was in this um, data? Was there anything else? Ask. This came from the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and so if you are interested, you can go back and look at that because they did ask those things. They did ask demographics, age, family status, and industry, and reason for resigning, and all those things. So with that, then we can answer a lot more of the questions that now we have with this data. But that is one of the fun things about statistics is that as you answer a question, then you may develop more questions because the data causes you to ask, well, why did that happen? Okay, so I encourage you to read your book on section 2.1 and 2.2 .2 to supplement this video and email me if you have any questions.